up, you beautiful bastards? Hope you're having a fantastic Tuesday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing I want to talk about today is this insanity between Project Veritas and the Washington Post. Yesterday, the Washington Post published an article titled, A Woman Approached the Post with a Dramatic and False Tale About Roy Moore. She Appears to Be Part of Undercover Sting Operation. Now, as we've talked about on the show before, Alabama Senate candidate Roy Moore has been accused of sexual misconduct with women as young as 14 years old. Now, Moore has repeatedly denied those accusations, calling them an attempt to derail his campaign. And as of right now, he's still staying in this race, despite both Democrats and Republicans calling for him to step down. But then in walks in a story worse than all of those before. A woman by the name Jamie T. Phillips comes forward to the Washington Post with an accusation that she had a sexual relationship with Moore when she was 15. And according to her, that relationship resulted in a pregnancy and an abortion. Also, before moving forward, when I say this story was worse than those that came before, what I mean by that is worse for Moore based on who's voting for him. Because despite accusations from women who were 14 and 16 years old at the time that, that Moore sexually touched them. Also, in one instance, he allegedly jammed one of their heads into his crotch, said no one will believe you. Despite that, Roy Moore still has a lead over his opponent. One of the things we keep hearing more and more from people saying they're still going to be voting for Moore despite all the stuff that's coming out against him is that his opponent, Doug Jones, is pro-choice, whereas Moore is not. And so the justification I've seen from more voters online is that they're just choosing the lesser of two evils. But back to this story. The Washington Post interviews Jamie Phillips for two weeks. And during those interviews, reporters found inconsistencies in her stories that made them suspicious. Reporters also found it odd that she would repeatedly ask them to guarantee that her coming forward with this story would have an effect on Moore's candidacy. And it gets really interesting when one reporter confronts her about the inconsistencies. And I'll link to the full video down below, but just to save some time, she says that she she applied for the Daily Caller, that job fell through. And the reporter moves on to what job she has currently. I'm also, you know, frankly want to know if you're, um, who, who you might be working for now. I work... I sold you mortgage work. Well, it's a little bit of an issue there, and you know, I just want to ask you to explain it, because when we called the company that you said that you worked for, um, they said they didn't have, that you didn't work there. Yes. You still have an interest in, in working uh, in the conservative media movement to combat the lies and deceit of the liberal MSM. Is that, no. is that still your interest? No, not really. Yeah. Not at this point. No. no. So, so if you're not working for that uh, mortgage company, where are you working? I I work for one of the branches. I don't work for one for of the corporate office. Uh huh. And what's the franchise? It's a. a you brand. said a friend. A brand, yeah. A brand. Maverick. Maverick. Yeah. And and where is that? In, um, it was out of Atlanta. And just in general, this is my opinion here, it appears that her, her whole story is waffling. She tries to save her story, but it seems like nothing's adding up. So of course the question becomes, okay, well, so if she didn't get that job with the Daily Caller like she said, on her GoFundMe page where she said she accepted a job for a conservative media site, specifically a conservative media site to combat the lies and deceit of the liberal MSM, who was she referring to? Well, on Monday morning, Washington Post reporters saw Phillips walking into the New York offices of Project Veritas. Now, if you're not familiar, Project Veritas is an organization that targets mainstream news outlets to expose what they claim to be media bias. And we've talked about them on the show before. They posted those those Nothing Burger videos, the videos about CNN, videos about the New York Times, YouTube. And on a personal note, for transparency's sake, when I see stuff from Project Veritas, I am very, very skeptical of it. The way the editing is done on most of the videos I've ever seen seems incredibly misleading. But back to the story, Project Veritas founder James O'Keefe declined to answer questions about Phillips that morning and when reporters followed up with him later. I am not doing an interview right now, We're so We're I'm not gonna say a word, okay? Now, because the Washington Post was convinced that Phillips was part of a sting operation, they decided to publish all of their interactions with her. This including the video of their confrontation and any previously off-the-record conversations. Executive editor Martin Barron saying, We always honor off-the-record agreements when they're entered into good faith. But this so-called off-the-record conversation was the essence of a scheme to deceive and embarrass us. The intent by Project Veritas clearly was to publicize the conversation if we fell for the trap. Because of our customary journalistic rigor, we weren't fooled, and we can't honor an off-the-record agreement that was solicited in maliciously bad faith. Then we see James O'Keefe tweet out a clip from that second an interview. And in it, he's the one grilling the reporter with questions. He tweets it out with a caption, the Washington Post sends a reporter to question me, but take a look, who's interviewing who? And in the video, O'Keefe just seems like this journalistic badass. The Washington Post came to ask him questions, but when he started asking the Washington Post questions, they ran away. But then the Washington Post responds with the full version of their interview, and it, it paints a completely different picture. One could very easily argue that it paints reality because it doesn't cut out a huge chunk of the interview. What we see in the footage that James O'Keefe and Project Veritas edited out was the Washington Post asking questions, getting zero answers from O'Keefe, who decided that his only response would be to ask questions back. And ultimately brings us to this point in the interview. So those are my questions, and I'd okay. like you to answer them. All right, well, I've, let, I've got some questions. And if you're not going to answer any of my questions, okay. 
and just ask me bad questions, I'm going to consider this interview to be over. Because okay. I, I didn't come here to answer questions, I came here to ask the questions. Right. I, right. I, I, I know what you I did. I approached you, you this morning to ask you a question. You said, come back, make an appointment. I came back and made an appointment. So it's my okay. turn to ask a question and your turn right. to answer it. Does Jamie Phillips work for you, I, sir? Here's what's happening. Veritas has an investigation that we're about to release. We've got some comments okay. by some of your staff. I, you, do you want me to talk or... I want you to answer one of my questions. Does Jamie Phillips work for Project okay. Veritas? Did you send her to approach the Washington Post under a false name and with a fake story? And I if you're want, not going to answer I, that I, question, I, we're I done. I want to talk about one of your I'm disappointed. national right. security reporters. You, Thank you. you came all the way up. And so it becomes clear that despite having this scheduled second interview, O'Keefe's not going to answer any questions. The guy from the Washington Post realizes, okay, O'Keefe's not going to answer any of my questions. It's time to leave. And that's where we get the Project Veritas video, which makes it look like the Washington Post is running away. So we have that complete misrepresentation from Project Veritas. Then Project Veritas posts another video. This one they say exposing the Post's bias agenda. And in the video, they talk to national security reporter Dan Lamoth. They also talk to Joey Marburger, the Washington Post director product. In the beginning of the video, O'Keefe tries to, to paint this picture that the Washington Post is scared about what he has on them. So that's why they're doing the story about an imagined sting. American Pravda, Washington Post edition. Today, the Washington Post is floundering. They're spending a ton of time and money trying to turn the tables on Project Veritas, talking about an imagined sting. But why are they so afraid? What are they so afraid of? What are they guarding against? Well, it turns out Project Veritas has done an undercover investigation into the Washington Post. The model of the Washington Post is democracy dies in darkness. We think democracy dies when the media has a very biased agenda they don't reveal to the public. But if you actually watch the video and, and you're not just listening to what O'Keefe is saying is happening in the video, nothing really transpires. Dan says this in the video. Yeah, don't like that. I mean, here's the, here's the thing though, there's like the, there's the news side that's just trying to cover it critically and call bull when they're bull but also like giving credit where there's credit. You know, like, he's yeah. doing something that's good, he's doing more things bad, but he's doing some good things good. Yeah. And then there's like, the other side of it, that's like, you know, the opinion from God, like the Washington Post institutional voice, and that's like the editorial. So hopefully what was just said was news to nobody. The news side, the reporting side, is calling bullshit on when there's bullshit, giving Trump credit when there's credit. And then in editorial, the opinion section, they rip into Trump. Right, hopefully everyone knows that there is a difference between a, a regular news story and an op-ed. And the thing that's frustrating is there's still gonna be enough people that go, oh, editorial, those are the editors that are screwing over the people just trying to do news. No, editorials are just the opinion section. So the post editorial section opposes Trump, news to nobody. There's also a part that talks about how Trump is good for business. Once again, that should be news to nobody. There's a reason why Stephen Colbert is now the king of late night. He beats on Trump every single day. Being the opposition has always been good for business. I mean, if you look at The Blaze, Rush Limbaugh, Infowars, all of these places thrive during an Obama administration. Now, also lucky for them during this time, you have a president that wasn't elected by popular vote. You have a very polarizing president, a president that is that is contested by the, uh, by many in the public. So they still get to thrive on being the opposition. Now they're just the opposition to the other guys, the media. And a big thing I want to hit on here is I'm all about exposing fucked up things in mainstream media. I'm all about trying to knock down someone trying to mislead the public. But it is also incredibly important to look at these independent outlets, including Project Veritas, and see if they are misleading. Because they, and myself included, benefit anytime people don't trust mainstream media and they want to support an independent outlet. But when you lie or misrepresent a situation to get that support, you are part of the problem. At the end of the day, what the situation looks like is we have Project Veritas, James O'Keefe, either hiring or working with a woman to knowingly lie to the Washington Post about a sexual assault, which by the way, all that does is hurt other actual assault victims. And then they put out these videos misrepresenting what happened as a way to deflect from the main story. James O'Keefe, I, I looked through your comment section. The people that support you will continue to support you. Many continue to eating it up as expected. Maybe you lose a few stragglers here and there that actually care about seeing the, the truth, the other side of the story. But for everyone else, all you did was make the Washington Post look like a fantastic establishment. It looks like someone tried to lie to the Washington Post to prove that just the media, they're just, they're out against more, they're out against Trump, they will post anything. And in this instance, they were proved to be 100% wrong. So congratulations on that. But from there, I wanna share some stuff I love today and today in awesome brought to you by Postmates. Postmates, of course, fantastic delivery on demand app. You just open up the app, you want something from a store or a restaurant, you select it and it is delivered to your home, your business, your wherever. With how limited my time is these days, it has become vital to my life. If you want to try it out, you're new, go to postafranco.com, download the app. When you're in the app, use coupon code
code Philly D. Use that and they'll give you $100 in free delivery credit. So that way, if you try it out, you love it, you get to keep using it. If not, well, your life became a little more convenient for a little bit and then you, you go back to normal. And the first bit of awesomes for those of you that maybe need a little assistance getting into the holiday season, we got a brand new video from Pentatonix where they sing Deck the Hole. And that's just the most recent of their videos. The last year they posted one for Hallelujah, easily my favorite. But yeah, I'll stop gushing about them. I'm just a big fan. Then we got the Honest trailer for The Room. I'm very excited for the Disaster Artist coming out this weekend, but if you need something to hold you over, here's a little treat. Then we got a brand new Binging with Babbage video. It shows you how to kind of make the garbage plate from the place beyond the pines. And if you want to see the full versions of everything, I just shared the secret link of the day, anything at all. Links, as always, are in the description down below. Then in, oh wow, that's, that's, that's a real thing news. Let's talk about Olivia Budgen. Olivia is a fitness blogger out of Australia, and she has recently come under fire for a post where she wrote, cancer and disease is your body trying to save you. Allow me to possibly challenge your belief about cancer and other diseases. What if these conditions were not actually bad at all? What if they were created by the body to help save you? What if disease is your body's survival mechanism? Being open-minded and changing your perspective around what disease actually is and why it's happening will allow you to take back control of your health and realize that your body is always working for you and never against you. Adding, in this modern day, we are consumed by the medical industry's information, which leads us to believe that disease happens to us through genetic disposition, but disease is a natural defense mechanism to prevent a much more serious situation from occurring. Olivia, what is a much more serious situation than cancer? The only escalation from having cancer seems to be dying from said cancer. Let me say this loud and proud for the people in the back. Do not take medical advice from random people on the internet. I don't care if it's some blonde woman drinking green juice saying that she's a fitness blogger. That does not make her qualified to question what we understand about cancers. And I personally get frustrated when I see Olivia because it reminds me of Belle Gibson. Gibson, you might remember, was the Australian fitness blogger who faked having brain cancer. She then claimed her natural diet cured her brain cancer. She sold she sold a book and app. She later got exposed for lying and the government cracked down on her. But when I look to Olivia, I'm not saying she did what was as bad as Belle Gibson. It just all comes off as batshit crazy. And I'm not saying Olivia is evil. I'll even give Olivia the benefit of the doubt. Let's say she has the best intentions. She shouldn't just be throwing out things that you can't confirm. Now Olivia has removed the post because there's a lot of backlash. That said, I do want to share my favorite comment I saw in response to this. Someone wrote, I would discuss this with my brother, but his healthy body saving leukemia killed him. That's that's funny, heartbreaking, and also shows the exact problem with what Olivia is talking about here. But also understand that most likely Olivia is going to keep feeding the internet stuff like this. I saw another post where she's holding, of course, a green juice and has the caption, there's only one disease, adding there are over 30,000 names to label different diseases in the world. But what if I told you there was actually only one disease? Okay, Olivia here, one, no. Uh, and two, why do you start all your captions like you're Morpheus? What if I told you, what if I told you you should, you should go to a doctor and not listen to random people on the internet? Whatever, it's the internet. I can't stop stupid from breeding. The internet has allowed us to accomplish so many things. It has changed our lives in so many ways, but it's also allowed for this orgy of stupid to take place. Anyway, moving on. Then a quick update to that YouTube adpocalypse story we talked about yesterday. This latest iteration of the adpocalypse being around child exploitation, completely inappropriate sexual or violent videos being fed to children. Also, a lot of these videos exposing that there is a huge child predator problem on the site. And yesterday I said that I thought YouTube was going to be very aggressive about it, and holy hell they are. It's being reported that YouTube deleted 150,000 videos that became targets for comments by child predators. YouTube also saying they deleted 270 accounts, turned off comments on 625,000 videos. YouTube also said they removed ads from around 2 million other videos and 50,000 channels. And when I hear those numbers, I think a few things. The first being, most likely they didn't find all the videos and this is going to be a consistent problem moving forward. The people that were making these horrible videos, they were profiting off of it, most likely they will try to adapt. They'll continue to try and find ways to beat YouTube at their own game. Also, when you hear 150,000 videos have been deleted, most likely th there were some probably okay videos deleted in the midst of that. But also when you have numbers that large, it makes you think of the, the biggest criticism of YouTube so far and that's how did they not notice this was a problem before? They as a company, did they have that much blind faith that the algorithm was going to do its job and filter out the content for the kids? Or did they just kind of turn blind. I think of this as just a small, minimal, nothing problem because they didn't want to rock the boat and hurt ad revenue. Or I want to end the story because it's still developing. We have to we have to see how successful YouTube is moving forward. Where I want to end the story is YouTube's reaction to this isn't going to be perfect. There is still going to be offending content on the site. Once again, what I would ask is to the parents out there that give their kid a, a tablet, a phone, just check in. Look at what kind of content your kid's consuming. If, you, if it ends up being one of the messed up pieces of content, don't just post something and be outraged online. Make sure that you flag that content. In an ideal 
real world, you're flagging one, it'll handle that situation there, but it also helps feed the algorithm so it knows what kind of content to watch for in the future. And that's where I'm going to end today's show. And remember, if you liked this video, you like what I try and do on the channel, you wanna support independent media, go to defrancoelite.com, sign up, become a member, support what we're making now and building for tomorrow. Also, if you missed and wanna catch up on yesterday's Philip DeFranco show, click or tap right there to watch that. Or if you wanna take a probably embarrassing dive into the past, uh, here's, here's a playlist for what happened today, but in years past. With that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces, and I'll see you tomorrow.